This will be recorded. Um, so if uh, worst comes to worst, if you do have some kind of tech issue, you will be able to get back to it later. But I don't anticipate that. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be smooth like everything else in the world right now. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Tiffany and David, and I'll be here in the chat just waiting for your questions. So take it away, Tiffany and David. I'm going to lose my video now because nobody wants to see me and because I don't have children and cute cats to run across the screen. So, um, so yeah, there goes the video. Hi, all. <laughs> so uh, Tiffany and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, all the work we and several other people have been doing on getting us migrated from Content DM to Islandora. Um, some of you have mentioned the adorable lobster who's on screen right now, and that's the Islandora mascot. Uh, Islandora, we'll get there later on, was developed on Prince Edward Island in uh, the Canadian Maritimes, and they have lots of lobsters there apparently, so so there you go. Um, so, who are we? I'm David, and Tiffany is... Oh, hello. I'm Tiffany. I am the Discovery Cataloger in Technical Services. And y'all probably knew that, but I thought we should all, we should give you voices and stuff too. Um, so the agenda for today is I'm going to talk a little about the background and how and why we ended up choosing Islandora and uh, how we kind of got to where we are now. Tiffany is going to talk about uh, discovery and metadata, which is a major, and I would say maybe the major and most exciting part of the migration project. And then at the end, we'll talk for a few minutes about uh, going live with it. So, um, how did we get here? Um, how did we, uh, he said in his best David Byrne voice. Um, well, let's see, we started out many years ago, actually long before I was even working at the university libraries with homegrown systems, uh, specifically uh, two big uh, projects that used uh, systems that were built in house were Civil Rights Greensboro and the Lemon Vets Historical Project, which have both been online you know, actually longer than I've been here. I came in at the tail end of Civil Rights Greensboro, so I did a, a work on the original launch of that to some extent. Uh, these are really great sites. They were early on in the game. Uh, they were customized for each project. They were really nice looking sites the Air Development team put together. The only downside is they sort of meant that anytime we started a new project, we had to start from scratch with a new, a new site and a new interface. Um, and at the time, we were not really set up for mass digitization. They were more up for kind of really curated, smaller boutique type projects, which we'd almost look at as digital exhibits now. Now, they could have been reworked, and there was talk about doing that apparently, but ultimately, at the time, and again, this was slightly before I was on the scene here, we decided to go with a commercial pre-built solution, and that solution was Content DM which we started using about 2008, maybe a little bit earlier. And uh, I'm putting its RIP date as 2020 because I want it gone by the end of the year, but we'll see how well that works. Um, the great thing about Content DM at this point is that it really did allow us to mount new collections and new projects really quickly. And it sort of gave us one interface more or less for every collection. Uh, that's a good thing in some ways because it meant there was no learning curve for staff or for end users who didn't have to learn, you know, how to do different searches and facets in different, different uh, platforms for each collection. Um, there were some issues too. Um, Content DM, yeah, um, <laughs> has um, a terrible mobile interface. Now they're working on it. It's better with newer versions that we're not using for a reason I'll talk about in just a second. But Content DM had some significant user interface problems in general, uh, particularly search engines, as many of you may have noticed when you were looking at newspapers or multi-page items, etc. When you do facet searches, there were all kinds of problems with that in Content DM. And that was the thing that maybe frustrated me the most about it. Uh, to make it worse, a couple of years ago, OCLC moved to an entirely new hosting model with Content DM, which meant we were going to be forced to do cloud hosting, in other words, hosting through OCLC. 
Uh, they quoted us a price that was the same exorbitant fee that we were paying for locally hosted content DM, but there was no guarantee that that wasn't going to go up over the years. And we decided at that point that it was probably time to look at a new solution, a new platform. So we did what librarians do. We formed a committee. Um, the committee was a Several people from ERIT uh, representing each of the uh, units in ERIT. We also had Beth Ann from Muscua and Anna Kraft from Tech Services. Uh, and we should have had someone from ROI, but didn't. Um, uh, the committee got together though and weighed several packages and ultimately went with Islandora. Um, it was a good open source package. Uh, it was being used uh, UNC Charlotte had recently migrated to it. It's being used to the University of Pittsburgh, the uh, Louisiana Digital Library, lots of Canadian universities, which of course, as you know, makes it better than anything else because, well, Canada. Um, but we did weigh several other packages as well. But we ended up uh, deciding that Islandora was the way to go. The migration to Islandora has not been seamless. It's been in process for almost two years now. Uh, Donnie and I first went to Islandora camp, which really didn't involve tents, um, in Halifax, Nova Scotia in the summer, almost two years ago this week, I think, uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia in the summer of 2018, where we learned everything about it. Unfortunately, over the next uh, year or so, we had tons of delays with implementing it due to some issues with uh, the ITS environment, uh, et cetera, at UNCG. We ultimately ended up calling in a consultant called Discovery Garden, which was made up of programmers who had worked on the initial Islandora project at uh, University of Prince Edward Island. They got us an installation, uh, actually several installations, up and rolling. Uh, and now we actually have a production installation as of about January of this year, uh, just in time for it to become a big pandemic project for me. So that was actually in some ways kind of good timing. Um, so what is Islandora? Well, here you see boilerplate text from the Islandora website, but basically Islandora is an open source content management system made up of three primary parts. There's Fedora, which I think a lot of you have heard of, which is the repository. That's where the actual objects and the metadata for the object live and are stored long-term. Uh, Fedora also has some digital preservation aspects to it as well. Um, then the next layer uh, is Islandora, which is the actual bridge between Fedora and another program called Drupal, which is a content management system, uh, just like WordPress, which I'm sure most people would be more familiar with. Drupal is the thing that actually builds and pushes out the website. Uh, it takes the Fedora, the uh, materials that are in Fedora and assembles them into a, uh, into a website. Islandora is the bridge between Drupal and Fedora that allows that to happen. Um, Solar, which is the cheese in the great Islandora cheeseburger, um, because it's optional, is the search engine that we use to search all that data within Drupal. So it's built on several open source platforms working together. Um, it w is free and will always be free. In software terms, defining always can be a little tricky, but um, but yeah, um, it was developed at the University of Prince Edward Island, but now there's a big open source community around it, which is actually a pretty, open, a pretty uh, active open source community, which is a good thing as we get into the pros and cons. Um, pros for Islandora are that it is very open source, so there is no initial payment for it. We don't have to pay to use the software. Hold that thought for a minute. Um, Islandora is also very customizable. It comes with a dramatically better user interface. We can use any standard Drupal template um, or build our own Drupal template, which means there's a lot of variety that we can use in the way that we can make it available to users. Uh, we can use responsive templates that make it work a lot better on mobile interfaces than Content DM ever did, and we're doing that. Uh, it allows for collection hierarchies, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute but there's some cons too and you notice the first two cons are the same as the first two pros because open source software is free but as i'm sure many of you have heard it's free in kind of the way that free kittens are free yes you don't pay any money right off the bat but um 
yeah, there are expenses with open source software. Um, uh, as we've had a lot of expenses, as we had actually had to bring in a consultant uh, because of our uh, operating environment here. Um, very customizable can be a little bit of a problem as well because you don't want to make things too customizable. Well, there are some problems with having too many options and building in too many, too much variation between collections. There's a big learning curve with Islandora. You know, it's uh, and a more complex backend. And also, since it is open source, you know, there's not a company we go to saying, you sold us this software, now fix it. Um, though there is our consultant and there is the Islandora community, which is very robust and I've learned a lot from that, as has Donnie, who's done a lot of, uh, a lot of really great work on this as well. So moving into Islandora, oh, and the lobster is the mascot, as I mentioned, which is where we get the whole lobsters and free kittens part of our presentation title today. So uh, kind of the great thing about moving into Islandora is it gives us a chance to sort of rethink our collection organization all the way around. And uh, specifically with respect to hierarchy, context, and topic tags slash metadata, and some examples. Uh, this is where we're currently going with the front page of the site. As you see, it's very topic based, uh, based on actually the four priority focus areas for our digital collections, which are local and regional history, UNCG history, visual and performing arts, and Women Vets historical project. We've also got a highlights section, uh, which are some, you know, if we have a project uh, of, like a textiles teachers and troops, which may fit in a lot of categories, et cetera, we can highlight that collection on those pages. There's also, as you see up here, a page that will take you to contributing institutions, uh, which is kind of nice. That's another level of hierarchy that we didn't have before. Content DM sort of gives you a list, um, and you can make landing pages, but it's sort of clunky. Uh, Islandora has a built-in hierarchy, so we can actually assign things to collections based on the contributing institution or repository, and we work with a lot of local partners, so that's kind of a good thing. It also gives us a chance to highlight individual collections more, more distinctly than we could in Content DM. So instead of a list of 4,000 women veterans historical project items, we can break it down and you can actually have a little better interface where you click in via, via collections or via the individual veteran, for example. Um, that was a big point, particularly with the Women Vets collection, which is why I highlighted it here. Um, another great thing is that it generates automatic collection level landing pages. Again, that was something we could do in Content DM, but it was kind of clunky. Um, and the really, really exciting thing for me, and uh, Tiffany's going to talk a lot more about this going forward, is uh, that we can combine better faceting along with more user-friendly metadata. So this is basically a chance for us to rethink how we present our digital collections and make them a lot more user-friendly. Uh, you see some of the faceting here uh, by types of items, for example, by topics, which is distinct from LC subject headings because we think they're more user-friendly for some of our collections uh, and can be on some levels a little more granular as well or on some levels actually a little broader where that will be a, where that would be a, a bonus. But we also have a traditional subject headings uh, search as well, or a facet. Um, it allows us to do things like integrate transcripts a little more fluidly. So a PDF transcript of this letter that you would see uh, on the side. And uh, it also gives us the Internet Archive book reader so that you can do uh, page flips in books. Uh, in practice, we're finding that only works well with certain types of content, manuscript collections and photos, obviously, not being a good example of that. But we're using the Internet Archive book reader where we can. Um, and I think you'll see from these screenshots, so it's a lot cleaner interface than Islandora has, and it does scale to mobile an awful lot better. So let's get into some of the nuts and bolts then. Um, a lot of file prep involved in getting ready for Islandora. Uh, what it's also, what it's forcing me specifically to do, and uh, the digital the digitization team is to kind of assess what we have, and a lot of it we're looking at for the first time. We've looked at it in about ten years or so. Um, 
there's a new file and folder structure for all collections that we need to put together for Islandora, um, which is actually a pretty major and monumental task. Let me be clear that this migration, there's not an automated path to migration from Content DM to Islandora, or particularly not the way we're doing it, where we're rethinking our metadata and our collection organization. So we're actually manually going through 10 years worth of stuff, which is you know, uh, 60,000 items in Content DM and something like three quarters of a million digital files. So we're touching a lot of stuff as we do this migration. Um, we had a temp working on this for a while. Uh, many of you will remember Wilson Miracle, who did who got a lot of this file prep work done a year or so when he was working as a temp. Uh, Kathy, Erica, Charlie, Tiffany, Callie, all of us have been working on various aspects of this over the past year. Um, getting the file prep done, getting files renamed, files moved. A lot of stuff has had to go into this, it's, but it's been kind of fun. And as again, uh, we'll end up with something that's a lot more consistent the next time we have to do this than, um, than dealing with the way our processes have changed over the years and through uh, multiple content management systems. So it's kind of a reboot. Uh, some of the tools we're using are Bulk Rename Utility, which is a great program that allows an incredible level of control over moving and batch renaming files. And that's a big part of what we do. Uh, really, you, this is the Swiss Army knife of file management for Windows. You can do some incredible things with uh, Bulk Rename Utility. Another program called File to Folder.GUI, which will actually take a bunch of files and put them in folders with the same name or if you have a list of multiple files, uh, it will it will associate them all together under folders with the same name. Uh, we also use Adobe Bridge. Um, since I've been working at home, since this is my pandemic project, I'm actually able to use some Mac tools as well. Uh, and we're also using an assortment of lovely Windows batch files. Um, these things have actually saved us weeks and probably months of work. So the automation tools are a big part of what we're doing. Um, with my end of the nuts and bolts, I'm going to pass it over to Tiffany now to talk about metadata. Oh, hello. So as David mentioned already, um, this migration gave us an opportunity to not only do an extensive metadata cleanup, but also re-examine our metadata holistically. So it's fine. <laughs> One concern with our metadata was the need to switch schemas. In Content DM, we use qualified Dublin Core for our metadata, and migrating to Islandora required us to switch to another schema called Metadata Object Description Schema, or MOZ. So MOZ is a much more granular schema compared to Dublin Core, meaning that we need to make our existing metadata more detailed. So one of the first steps in the preparation process for the migration was to create a crosswalk between the qualified Dublin Core used in Content DM and MODS. So to help with the process, we consulted the Library of Congress MODS DC map to help create our crosswalk. Next slide, please. So here's a quick screenshot from the Library of Congress MODS DC map to help illustrate the granularity of MODS. As you can see, it's not always a quick, easy one-to-one -one comparison for every field. So we had to figure out where we can enrich our metadata, at least by moving to a more granular schema instead of the other way around, we didn't lose any detail in our metadata. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an overview of our metadata workflow for this project. First, we exported the metadata out of the old system, did some cleanup, worked on switching schemas, and finally changed the format that our data is in. Next slide, please. Once the team settled on a crosswalk and developed a guide for changing our metadata fields, then we can actually begin the metadata workflow. The first step in this process was to export all of the metadata out of Content DM and into spreadsheets. Second, we then began the metadata cleanup process within Excel. Next slide, please. So for the cleanup process, we perform metadata consistency checks in Excel. We checked for things like missing values in the metadata, ensuring that the dates were in ISO format, removing brackets where needed, and deleting any stray semicolons. After that step, we began the mods mapping phase where we could switch the Dublin Core metadata to mods and make all the necessary adjustments to the fields. Within the spreadsheets, we were able to complete specific metadata enhancement tasks that were just simply easier to do in Excel. So for example, we needed to combine all the fields containing personal and corporate names, which were all separate before. So by using the concatenate function, we were able to combine names where needed without having to do each single one manually. 
plus we included mark later terms for each name as an required expansion for the mod's metadata profile. We also needed to switch control vocabulary terms to new ones in specific fields. So for example, we mapped the Dublin Core type field to the MOZ type of resource field. And with that change, we moved from the DCMI item type vocabulary terms to one specified by the MOZ guidelines. Next slide, please. So we imported edited spreadsheets into OpenRefine and completed the field transformation tasks that are just trickier to achieve in Excel, such as splitting a single field into multiple ones based on a designated separator or using the Google Refine expression language or GREL to transform dates. So for those who are unfamiliar, OpenRefine or formerly Google Refine is an open source program that is great for cleaning up and working with medium to large size data sets. It runs on PC through a web browser, so it's not ideal for extremely large sets of data. If you try to do so, it'll likely crash. Um, next slide, please. So the next step in the process is to export our data out of OpenRefine and into one single XML file. Once the cleanup and field transformations are complete, we used OpenRefine's templating tool to generate the XML file containing all the metadata for an individual subcollection. The XML template that we use for this step of the workflow is adapted from one created by the University of Toronto Scarborough. Next slide, please. After we finished working with OpenRefine, we took our shiny new XML file and moved it into Oxygen XML Editor. Here we split the exported XML file into multiple ones. To do this, we ran two XSLT adapted from our colleagues over at UNC Charlotte. The first transformation removes any extra blank lines in the code, and the second transformation creates separate files for each individual item in the subcollection. And the results of all of this are individual item level XML files that are ready to in for ingest into Islandora. And now I'll turn it back over to David. Okay, I'm David. Um, <laughs> I, uh, the current status and next steps are we are at the uh, we are at the ingest point right now, which is where we're using all those lovely, um, <laughs> all those lovely lovely XML files that were made in the last step. Uh, there are multiple ways to ingest materials into Islandora, uh, but batch ingest and a lot of other things can kind of best be done using the command line, which has meant I've had to brush up on using the command line. It's something I hadn't done in of several years so that's that's been lots of fun and this is probably the ugliest single screen that you'll see in this whole presentation but the idea is the one on the left with the red thing that says error is what we don't want to end up with the one on the right with all the lovely green things that say okay are what we do want to end up with um, that was kind of an oversimplification but yeah you get where I'm going with this okay <laughs> so um this is what the ingest uh, you know, ends up looking like. So far, we've already ingested over 16,000 items, which uh, equates to over 200,000 files. But uh, we started with the labor intensive part. So women vets being a particularly labor intensive one because, <coughs> excuse me, it was 600 small collections. So that required a lot of hand holding. So theoretically, the rest of this operation should go an awful lot faster. Again, it's not an automated process. So, um, but as you can see, this is sort of examples of uh, some of the items we've got up. We've got uh, over 6,200 items in the women's history topic, obviously, since the Women Vet Project is one of the ones that we've already ingested. Um, photographs are a big part, but also newspapers, newsletters, pamphlets, correspondence. Um, and you can see some of the actual Women Vets collections and see that it's a much nicer interface because you, know, you actually get to see an image of the veteran and uh, you can click on the link and actually go to material related to that particular veteran. And it's like that for all our different manuscript collections as well. Um, you know, we can have representative images, et cetera. And there's just a little more attention to the hierarchy and the structure of the, of the physical collections. And that's kind of what we work toward with digital collections is that whole context thing, making sure that the actual digital collection is as close a representation as possible of the physical collection and also that we actually get that context in there with the collections. So uh, we have already ingested our community collections and community collections are defined as 
collections that community members, community organizations, it could be schools, churches, et cetera, allow us to digitize, but then we give back. There are a lot of collections like that, um, particularly uh, prominent in our community collections are the Well-Crafted NC Project uh, that documents brewing history, the um, Pride of the Community Collection, which documents LGBTQ plus history in the triad, and the new uh, Black Lives Matter collection that we're working on as well. These are mostly community collections where we don't actually physically have the stuff. People donate to us either in physical or digital format, and then they get to keep their stuff. Um, those have mostly been ingested, as have most of our partner collections. Uh, as you see, uh, the collections we've worked with, a t Bennett, Guilford, the, all the colleges with Cone Health, though more of that coming, uh, and the Greensboro Public Library. We've already ingested all the UNCG library stacks or book materials and a lot of the uh, vertical files that we scanned before we got rid of our vertical files. Um, we have already ingested 99% of the Women Veterans Historical Project. There are some stragglers I'm working with and 95% of our manuscript collection. So we've got a pretty, pretty good array of content already ingested into Islandora. Um, still to add, however, are the University Archives collections, though I've actually plugged in the Carolinian collection right now, which is a big part of that. Um, our UNCG Special Collections and Rare Books, which uh, includes uh, the American Publishers Trade Binding Collection, as well as all our cello music collections. Those are, those are in the process of being ingested right now. Um, and I think I'm required to mention at this point that UNCG does have the largest cello music collection in the world. Uh, there are one or two remaining manuscript collections that have not yet been ingested. And we have not ingested our collections, uh, our significant amount of material that was digitized for the Greensboro History Museum yet, because the archivist at the Greensboro History Museum is kind of taking a holistic look at their metadata as well and making some tweaks and changes before we ingest their content, which is great because that means she's doing that and I don't have to, which makes me very happy. Um, Wow, we're running a little short. We're running a little a little fast here, so we'll probably have a lot of time for questions if you want us to. Um, so our go live date and hold me to it. Uh, sorry, that was uh, that was supposed to be a topical reference, but I look at it now, I think it's just kind of dumb. Um, our target date for going live is going to be November of 2020. I hope that we'll be going live on 2020. There are a couple things that I need to deal with as well as getting things into the material, into the collections. Uh, I'll be working with Tiffany probably a lot on these as well, uh, which is making sure that all our content that is currently ingested into the Digital Public Library of America and the WorldCat gets mapped properly to its new locations in Islandora. Um, that's going to be a big part and you're know, making sure that everything works right having some you know user testing and letting people look at it and tweaking things that we need to fix etc um but hopefully uh i'm pushing for november as a start date we'll see where we go with that and there's some future enhancements we're thinking about now uh, we uh to make our collections a little more digestible we are hoping for particularly our larger projects that have a whole lot of content to start um integrating Emeka exhibits, which kind of give like a highlight or a look at the collection. So you can say, oh, this is all the stuff that's in the textile or the kind of stuff that's in the textiles teachers and troops or good medicine or uh, Charles Duncan McKeever collection, for example. So integrating those Emeka exhibits, uh, possibly finding ways to integrate our digital collections with our finding aids, which I think is a big, uh, a thing that I really want and I think that SKUA particularly really wants as well. So uh, hopefully we will be able to come up with a good way of integrating these uh, uh, to make the finding aids more useful and the digital collections more useful because you, know, you can go back and forth between them easily. And ultimately we'd like to end up with some kind of cross search for other triad history collections too, the ones that are at different universities, etc. So we can kind of bring them all together into a big portal, which is if you will, kind of one-stop shopping for triad history collections. Uh, we're looking into some other things as well, like uh, what other things we might be able to use in uh, Islandora for, maybe an experiment 
for things like uh, institutional repositories or other digital collections as well. And um, that's really kind of all I have. Um, Tiffany, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, I, really early. <laughs> I think that pretty much covers the bulk of the whole process. I think we got the highlights. Okay. I'm going to uh, stop sharing now so I can go back in and see chats and that kind of thing. And stuff. So, uh, so uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, one from, from Catherine is, what if that doesn't happen? And I think this means the date. Uh, what if you don't meet the date deadline, maybe? Um, Catherine can clarify. Um, but is there a bet going on? Is there, is that, is a question from Catherine? So I think the big question you're looking at is if there is a pool that people could potentially win money out of, to which I would say no, but maybe there should be. Excellent. If anybody, if anybody wants to start one, um, you could, you could count on me to chip in. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Um, all right, Anna asks, what is the biggest surprise you've encountered in the transition to Islandora? Um, I'll jump in with mine, and Tiffany, you can jump in with yours. Mine is that um, how logical it all started seeming after I worked with it for a couple of months. And I think uh, as much as I don't like to give any credit to the pandemic for anything, the fact that I've actually been working on this at home without interruption for the last few months has actually allowed me to interact with the software a lot better and we've become one which sounds really creepy but um but you know it's, it's starting to make a lot of sense to me and it's actually a very logical and rational rational bit of software um i'm also a less happy surprise is learning how inconsistent some of our file naming and structures have been over the past 10 years or so. Less so than I think a lot of other places, but still not as consistent as I would have liked to make the transition easy. Tiffany? Hmm, that's a good question. The biggest surprise thus far, I think when working with the metadata and actually going through like the steps I like described, kind of like, oh wow, kind of, I feel like I initially underestimated how much we had. It's only when I started working through the spreadsheets and doing the transformations, like, oh, this is a lot and a lot of detailed information. So, yeah. yeah. All right, awesome. So do we have any other questions? I don't think I, missed any questions that came up in the chat. There was some conversation, but I don't think I missed any questions. If y'all have questions, you can please feel free to put them in the chat, or if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question, that's fine as well. We'll uh, take a couple of minutes for that, but there's also no problem if we decide to end early. I think everyone enjoys the gift of time. Going back and looking at the chat now, and I would have to agree that cheese is in fact not really ever optional. I think that was the popular opinion as well. So, um, all right. So Catherine says we've got to figure out that lobster mascot name. Um, and Christine says this is an amazing project. It'll be great when the migration is complete. We hope. I uh, always want to thank Tiffany for explaining metadata stuff so clearly. It seems so simple when you explain it. <laughs> Well, and thank you. To follow. I know it's incredibly complicated, um, and I always appreciate your, you know, approach to that. Uh, I see that Anna has another question. Anna, please feel free to type or unmute yourself and speak. Thank you. This was a really good session, you guys. Thanks very much. So my question is, um, if you were to give advice to another institution or another department that was planning a transition, where would you tell them to start in terms of looking at their existing collections and thinking about moving to Islandora? Wow, that's hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. I don't know, I would say a big, a big thing for me is making sure that there is a very distinct relationship between the way the digital collections are presented online and the way the physical collections exist 
in nature. So coming up with a way that you can provide some context to show that what's digitized might be part of a larger whole that isn't necessarily all digitized or you know that it fits that it fits into a bigger picture is important um as far as organization you know uh particularly with archival collections it is sort of hierarchical in nature you've got repositories collections boxes folders and there actually is a very distinct hierarchy and it actually makes a lot of sense to think about that when you're putting the collection online too, because, and Islandora is great because it actually allows more for that hierarchy than Content DM did. Yeah, I know for this project, like we as a team um, did spend a lot of time looking at kind of, okay, this is the new organizational structure. How are we going to update and change our metadata profile? So that is one point in that like other people who might be doing this process need to like spend time really thinking about, I would say, because like I mentioned earlier, moving from Dublin Core, because we just have, you know, qualified Dublin Core and mods requires a lot more detail. We had to figure out, so where are we going to enhance? Are we need to add this? Do we need to add that? So forth and so on. So that is one thing to consider. Yeah, figuring out what in that process is actually useful to end users and what part isn't because ultimately that's the goal. I mean, you know, obviously we are we are partially the audience for some of these collections, but ultimately the end user is the primary audience. So they've got to be first and foremost, you know, what makes it work better for users rather than what necessarily makes it work better for us. Yeah, I agree. And also in that same vein, um, we did also look at kind of local terms for our collections to also help with you know, enhance accessibility and people being able to browse through our collections and find the topics that they're interested in. Whether we did that right remains to be seen. We do the best we can. <laughs> I think we're all doing the best we can, particularly right now. All right, do we have any other questions for Tiffany or David? In case anyone is going to have to head out, I'm going to put in our assessment form link. Y'all know that I really appreciate it when you fill this out. It helped us um, make some choices about different sessions that we've had. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much to both David and Tiffany, especially for agreeing to uh, present again to the ULVLC. Um, we have lots of fun stuff coming up with the ULVLC, so I hope you have been uh, keep it up with those uh, emails that I send that I know everyone just anticipates weekly. You're just waiting for those. And there's also the ULVLC LibGuide that you can always visit. I'll put that in the chat. Oh, thanks, Patrick. You took my self-deprecating joke and made it something heartfelt and heartwarming. All right, that's our LibGuide, so you can take a look and see what we've got coming up. We've got two more sessions this week. We've got, by popular demand, Letters from SCUA, part two. Uh, if you didn't attend the first one, it was a delight, and I definitely recommend looking back at that one. Um, and then we also have another Python playground. Those are small but mighty and very popular with the folks that like to attend. So if you have any questions at all about the ULVLC, please feel free to contact me. If you've got an idea for a session, just know I'm always open to hearing about it. Um, and I really appreciate everyone's time and energy in both presenting and participating today. So I really appreciate all of you. I hope you all have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you all.